Today I'm going to venture into a debate and I realize that there are people who have strong views one way or the other about this. The question is, when you're restoring a piece of vintage equipment like this uh, fine Zenith radio, should you replace all the electrolytics or not? And the reason it's become a, a problem or a debate is some people believe that the answer is absolutely if you believe in God then you replace all the electrolytics. And if you don't believe in God you replace all the electrolytics. And other people believe that no you really should if, there's, if the electrolytics are still in good shape you should keep them in the radio partly to preserve the, the uh, if you will, the, the total uh, design of the radio. Some people go so far as to stuff and so on. I have been on all sides of this and I am still willing to be convinced one way or the other. But because I have a background in uh, statistical quality control and I was involved with uh, of some of the electronics manufacturers during the space program in the uh, 60s and 70s and into the 80s and even after that in the design and uh, so on. <clears throat> I feel like that I have at least some facts to offer and some opinions. Now the facts I think stand on their own but today some people <laughs> seem to believe if there's a fact that they don't want to listen to that they just call it fake. But so, you know, I, I realize this is a debatable area and some people will get upset if I don't say that they're right. The reality is that whether you should replace the electrolytics, in my opinion, is a question of the situation. So let me tell you why I believe that and give you some examples that will give you some guidance. It's what I use when I decide whether to do this. And I've done, you know, what some people call shotgunning, just blow out all the old capacitors, put in all brand new. And I have done stuffing, and I have done reforming, and I have done testing and leave it alone. So let's talk about some of these issues. And by the way, what I'm not talking about is repairing more modern stuff like this Zenith post-war AM radio that uh, is basically an All-American 5 and things like that. Nor am I talking about uh, non-vintage electronics of other types like your MP3 player or your, or your smartphone or things like that. I'm just going to be talking about vintage equipment and the electrolytics in them. So the question is, if you're dealing with vintage electrolytics, and I'll you know, give you a little of my definition of what that means in a little bit, the question is, do you replace them all or do you just replace the bad ones? Now obviously you have to replace the bad ones because that will keep the radio or the uh, uh, console, whatever it is you're working on, television, from working. And there are some good points to doing them all. It's faster. You don't have to try to figure out which ones are good and which ones are bad. You just go in and uh, remove. Uh, some people just clip them out. Some people unsolder them for reasons that I'll get to in a little bit. I don't like unsoldering. But uh, nonetheless, you uh, if you don't have to do all that, it's faster. You remove the old ones, put in a whole new set, and and in the, in the final analysis, it is less work, and it's a no-brainer. You don't have to think. So basically, it's kind of what uh, a friend of mine used to call a bumper sticker brain. Uh, you know, you can do it all in three words. Replace them all. Okay? And as a justification for this, some people say that, well, this is to protect the transformer, or the radio will work longer. Well, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little more, whether that's really true. Obviously, your other alternative is to replace the bad ones. This requires some skill. You have to know how to tell a good capacitor from a bad capacitor. It 
need to take some equipment. You have to be able to test the capacitors for things like capacity and leakage. And it doesn't hurt if you can also test things like ESR and dielectric absorption and so on. But, but you don't really need fancy equipment, but you do need some. And as I pointed out, it does take more time. But whether you replace the, just the bad ones or you replace the uh, replace them all, you have to worry about the new ones. What quality capacitor are you using? What's its temperature rating? And second, are you have you been confused by people saying that the best way to protect the transformer is to replace the fuses? I mean, to the uh, capacitors. The truth is, a properly sized fuse, if it doesn't have one, add one. If it already has one, make sure it has the right size. Well, a properly sized fuse will do a lot more to protecting expensive components like transformers than whether you replace the good capacitors with new good capacitors. The next thing is, it depends on the age of the equipment, when it was designed, when it was made. The reason is, that, uh, as we'll talk about in a second, the failure modes of electrolytics were taken into account by the original designers, both before and after World War II. And it was only when cost became such an important part of the manufacturing process that quality of electrolytics began to go down to the point where you really just can't depend on them, and maybe it would be better just to replace all of those. But that's because the capacitors that were put in, particularly after about 1955, were just not as good. To understand some of this a little better, let's talk about failure modes. Now, a, an electrolytic can fail shorted almost any component of uh, a regular paper cap, for example, uh, can fail shorted. And by the way, I'm not talking here about paper caps. Most paper caps, it probably is better if you replace those because they will go out, but that's not really true of all electrolytics. Most electrolytics, when they do fail, go partially shorted. And some people call that leakage because it just means that they draw a little more DC current than they did when they were new. By far, the biggest catastrophic failure of an electrolytic is fail open. And most of the time when the electrolytic dries out and the capacitor fails, it's because it loses all its capacity and it just becomes an open circuit or virtually an open circuit. There also is an issue with high ESR, but that only becomes a serious issue when switching power supplies became a part of this because the frequencies were high enough that the equivalent series resistance became a factor in the, the load on the circuit. So, in general, most of the tube equipment, ESR is not an issue. So, what are the eras that we're talking about? Well. There's a pre-war era, then there's what I call the post-war to the space age, and by that I mean from 1945 to about 1960, or 1958, 57. Then was the space age, which I would say that largely what I'm talking about here is the time from the, the first uh, man in space, uh, the John Glenn era, in other words, through the Apollo landings on the moon. And I was involved in electronics during this time, and the, the key there was uh, reliability. Talk about that a little later. About the same time as the space age, we entered what I would call the consumer age, and these are two entirely different classes of equipment. The, uh, and then we have moved into the modern age. And by modern age, I mean little bitty stuff, surface mount components, size is everything, and uh, the big problem is getting a, enough battery to, to last you a reasonable amount of time in such a small case and so on. But 
there are virtually no electrolytics in modern age equipment that are like the electrolytics that most people like to shotgun. Now, if you want to go in and, and replace all the SMD capacitors, that's up to you. I'm not debating that question today. Pre-war, electrolytics were much larger than they are today. And because of that, they had more electrolytic in them. They also had more aluminum in them. Today, electrolytics have a very, very thin layer of electrolyte and a very, very thin aluminum uh, foil uh, as an electrode. Those are much more likely to fail shorted because of that much thinner structure. Little pinholes, little uh, imperfections in the material, uh, of temporary overvoltage spike and so on is likely to blow a hole in a, in a modern capacitor, whereas in the old capacitors that almost never happened. So in the 45 to 65 period, there, were, uh, there was a transition from consoles to tabletops. Radios went mostly All-American 5s. In other words, no, no power transformer anymore. Series string. Hi-Fi and stereo began to come in. And in those cases, there tended to be two versions. One was a fairly expensive console version with nice speakers and power transformers and everything. And the other was cheap stuff that was basically an All-American 5 uh, with an input for a phonograph. This era also was the beginning of the design to cost era. Now by design to cost, they always tried to design to cost, but it wasn't the primary issue. But by the 1965, a practice had occurred, actually before then, in which manufacturers would actually take a, a good design and go in and clip out parts and see if it still worked. If it still worked, they'd throw that part away, take it out of the design. So that is how things were in 1965. Now I'm going to carry this uh, chronology forward just a little bit more to the modern day, but for m purposes of what I'm going to be talking about, uh, I think that 65 is probably the cutoff. In other words, anything that is built after 1965 you really have to ask yourself, well, what kind of capacitors are in there? Was the circuit designed to accommodate uh, a failure? And does it have a proper size fuse? Because I was involved in a lot of electronics during what I call the spaceflight era, and I'm not talking about the, the, uh, uh, the shuttle and orbiters and the space station, I'm talking about the, the the space flight, manned space flight, that carried man outside the, uh, the Earth's atmosphere. During that time, smaller was really important and more reliable was really important. When Apollo 13 ran into serious problems, there was not a service station to pull into. They had to figure out how to get them back and they did, but it was a very close run thing. Reliability was very, very important. And because of that, uh, the space program and the contractors in the space program put a lot of money and time into statistical quality control. And literally cost was no object. Now, the military learned a very serious lesson after World War II with their electronics because they thought that that because mill spec was basically build it big and heavy that that guaranteed reliability but as the space program began to look at what it what it really took to be reliable the military realized that they had to revise their standards as well and and if you look at a lot of the mill standards you'll see that as the space program got better so did the military equipment more reliable at the same time, there was a movement going in exactly the opposite direction. The consumer electronics movement. Cost became the top priority. Space, I don't mean outer space, I mean the 
the size of the uh, of the unit became highly important. Televisions began to replace radios, and mostly the uh, local dealers sold the consumer electronics and they had internal service departments. Today, things are quite different. Today, we have automated manufacturing. Most electronics is either sold through big box stores or the internet, neither of which has a friendly service department. Uh, there, I realize there are a couple of big box stores. I'm not trying to uh, shortchange Best Buy, but uh, or Fry's. But the the uh, the reality is that because of the automated manufacture, it's very expensive to do component level repair today. And so, what used to be done is no longer done. In other words. We're in a, an era of throwaway mentality with regard to electronics. And the, the advent of handheld devices have made that even more important or have accelerated that trend. So that today, when a device fails, it's probably cheaper and easier just to throw the whole thing away. Okay, now let's take a look at a few capacitors and why I think that you should actually, if you have the skill and the equipment, you should separate the good from the bad in vintage equipment. Here is an example of a capacitor that you can tell is bad just by looking at it. You see this little uh, area of corrosion? That is electrolyte that has oozed out from inside the capacitor. It could be that it got too hot, it could be there always was a leak there and it uh, leaked out, but nonetheless this is clearly a capacitor that's seen its, uh, its better days. It needs to be replaced regardless of your philosophy. This one, on the other hand, is one that I replaced and there's nothing wrong with it. It's perfectly good. In my early days, I used to replace all the capacitors because some people use that as a, uh, as a technique to restore old equipment without having to, to troubleshoot it. They don't, you don't need to understand the equipment. You don't need to have any troubleshooting knowledge or equipment to do so. You just go in and shotgun all the capacitors and sometimes the unit will come back to life. So th this is one of those I did. Now, I don't have the same excuse that people with little experience and, and no equipment have because I had the experience and the equipment and I still did it. So. I'm not saying that you can't still do this. It's, it's not, uh, we're not trying to establish a religion here. We're just saying that if you want to preserve the vintage equipment in as close to its original condition as possible, don't just no-brain it. Think about it, test it. If it really is a bad capacitor or you have reason to believe, for example, its leakage is much higher than uh, capacitors of the period, then yeah, go ahead and replace it. But if all it is is it's been in there a long time, particularly in the older equipment, put a fuse in, leave the capacitor in there. Now the same is true of canned electrolytics. But there is one thing that can go on in a canned electrolytic that particularly in audio equipment can be problematic. And that is, in addition to the capacitor itself leaking or becoming of lower capacity and so on, what you sometimes get is, is feed through from one side to the other of the capacitor. In other words, not from the capacitor lead to the can, which is the negative, but from this capacitor to that capacitor. And for that reason, you have to know a little more about how to test the capacitor because it's not just each individual capacitor, but in multi-section units like this, you actually have to test whether there is anything that is going on between the two capacitors before you decide to leave it in the equipment. So, what's the final analysis? Well, whether you decide to Replace them all or just replace the bad ones.
if you understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, you'll be a smarter technician and you'll wind up with something closer to the goal you set out to achieve. But I would emphasize that if you have the skill and if you either have or are willing to acquire the necessary equipment, then you might want to consider just replacing the bad capacitors, electrolytic capacitors. If the unit doesn't have a fuse, put one in. For those of you that might wonder, well, what are the kinds of things, the equipment that I might want to buy? There, the This is a uh, sort of top of the line uh, capacitor and also inductor tester. It's made by Sencor, it's the LC-102, they also made an LC-103, and there are some earlier models of this that are also out there on eBay. As far as I know, Sencor doesn't build any of these anymore, uh, partly because very little that's made today has replaceable capacitors anyway. But I'm going to use this as a prop, but before I do, I would like to uh, assure you that you do not need a piece of equipment this complicated or this expensive. Uh, I did a video some time ago about a little simple DIY capacitor tester which will test leakage. That is actually better used for testing leakage of paper capacitors and things like that, but my recommendation is those maybe you should replace. But the they can also be used to test electrolytics if you learn to wait and see how the flashes decline over time. But a better way is a power supply with enough voltage and a current meter. A simple milliamp meter will usually do. In fact, most capacitors, if they're good, will only measure a, a milliampere or two of leakage current and, and a lot of them down in the 800 to 500 microampere range. I'm talking about fairly large, fairly high voltage electrolytics. So let's zoom in on this part and I will talk a little bit about what these are. Now over here you can enter the value of the uh, capacitor. You can enter its percentage, in other words its tolerance. You can enter the voltage and uh, the bottom is for uh, inductors, so we won't worry about that. And then over here, the four are the four things that you might want to test for. The capacitor value, the capacitor leakage, the dielectric absorption, and the ESR. But the one that really makes the biggest difference in uh, vintage equipment is capacitor leakage. As long as the value is good enough to remove the hum, which was its purpose. Remember, we're ta talking about 60 hertz generally here, or maybe 120 hertz in a, in a full wave. If you've got enough capacitor value left, and it's not leaking too much, I suggest you leave them in the equipment. But I'll close with one caveat. It also depends on how you plan to use the equipment. If it's a radio that you're going to be turning on several times a week to listen to things, then leaving them in is actually a good idea because the capacitors will be constantly used and that reforms them. If you've put a fuse in, if it didn't already have one, you're pretty well protected against a failure in the future. But you'll not only preserve the original radio or electronic equipment, but until the leakage becomes too high or the value drops off too much, you'll be enjoying it exactly the way it came out of the factory. However, if you are going to restore a radio and put it in the attic for 10 years and then get it out and turn it on, then I'd replace all the capacitors simply because the capacitors that are in there are going to age for another 10 years and they will not be reforming. So if there is a, a small chemical issue in the capacitor, it'll just get worse over time. Most electrolytics made before about 1965 
will actually reform themselves unless they fail catastrophically. And when they fail catastrophically, they generally go open, which means the capacitor value goes to zero, the hum goes out of sight, or maybe I should say out of ears. But other than that, there's no real harm. Go in and replace the capacitor now that it really is bad and go on with your life. So I hope this video is useful. I'm sure it will spark some debate. And there are those who believe that the gospel, according to YouTube, is replace them all. But if you know a little more about electronics and you're willing to think about what you're doing, I think you'll say, okay, this is certainly worth thinking about. I shouldn't just shotgun all of them. I should at least consider leaving some of the originals in if they are still good. So look forward to some more videos, but I'll get off this topic. Here endeth the lesson for the day, the, the, the gospel according to Tom Tech Test, and uh, look forward to some other videos, and please do have a nice day.